Hello and welcome to TI Codes Club, session number five, our final in the series. Today, it's part two of selecting your hardware, and that is responding to data. We're going to be looking at actuators that can be, in one way or another, attached to your TI Innovator Hub. You will recall, recall that last week we did part one of selecting your hardware, and that was when we focused on inputting data by way of sensors. Guiding us through that was our regular presenters, Peter Fox from Texas Instruments and Sanjeev Meston from Furbank Grammar School. Both of those gentlemen join us again for this session, as well as some additional pre-recorded clips from our trainers from further afield from, from Queensland. Please welcome Carly Nichols, a T-cubed trainer there. And from Western Australia, Jody Crothers, a T-cubed trainer there as well. Now, um, Jody's going to be showing us something on the TI Innovator Rover, which we haven't yet looked at in this series. Jody, I would say, is the national expert on, on Rover. Uh, and he's made many such clips of the activities that he has done with his students. You can see there the link to his YouTube channel. Now, we hope that you've uh, really enjoyed the journey across the five weeks of TI Codes Club. You'll recall back at the about a month ago, start of March, when we had our first session on getting started. Now, that event looked at the essential documents and the processes involved in joining the 2022 Codes Club or Co TI Codes competition. All of these events are uh, recorded for you to review to review but if you are looking to uh, enter the competition this year entries due in on friday this week it may well be worth reviewing the recording of getting started so that is available of course on the texas instruments australia webpage and also our youtube channel now you can see in the second session the engineering design process i have here a couple of slides that we looked at then I really view the process of setting up your project as, as being one of building blocks. Think of the calculator at the, and the code that you write as being at the heart of the system. Now, to inform its decision-making process, it needs to gather data, if, if it's interacting with the external world, world, one way or another. Now, last week, as I said, we looked at data being input by way of sensors. Some sort of process takes part inside the brain of the, of the um, system, that is your calculator and code, and then what do we want to happen in response to that? So that's driving some sort of actuator or the output. You can see the example I have here where the actuator is a Grove mini fan. The sensor, for example, could be inputting temperature from the environment and the process could be, well, at what temperature, perhaps when temperature reaches greater than 25 degrees, do we then turn on the fan? Now, plugging in the actuators, I see as being in a range of ways. Firstly, there are some actuators that are directly on board the TI Innovator Hub. That is, there is a couple of uh, light emitting diodes, and there is also a speaker for sound. So you've got sound and light directly on board. Taking it further, there is a range of devices that you can plug in directly into the output ports of the hub. That Grove mini fan is one such example. Going even further, at the end of the hub, there is a small breadboard to which you can plug in devices directly, or you can connect to a larger breadboard, further power supplies, further devices, and basically the sky's the limit, in, the limit in what you choose to drive from there. As I alluded to earlier, there is a completely separate um, machine called TI Innovator Rover, which you don't have to use for the competition, but you may, you may wish to. And th that's basically a robot uh, robot vehicle uh, that can drive around and do a whole range of things and it the it has the TI Innovator hub fitted into it directly and also the calculator for control. But let's just take it back to the start looking at onboard actuators. We're going to firstly take a look at 
the example of a tricolour diode, red, green, blue diode. That will be demonstrated by Carly Nichols from Queensland. Uh, so I will cut across now to Carly's clip. I have in Carly's clip um, sped through some of the coding process just in the interest of time. So you'll see when we do the little cartoon hurry up there. Okay, over to you, Carly. Hi, everyone. My name is Carly Nichols and I'm from Fairhome College. Today, I am very excited to be able to show you some things on the Innovator Hub. So we're going to make this um, Innovator Hub light up. And I'm also going to show you how to, you could use the temperature sensor. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so here we have our Innovator Hub and I've got my um, cord connector. So I've got my A cord powered to my calculator there. And then I've got the B cord attached to the data input there. Okay, um, once you know that you're attached properly, you've got a little light that shines up there. Okay, all right, let's make this color. I'm going to go to a new document. So enter. Just not going to save that one. Now I'm going to go to option nine. I'm just going to add a program editor, open up a new document. And then I'm just going to call this um, color. Let's see. <clears throat> enter. Okay. So I'm in my program here. Okay, you can see my little cursor's in my box, ready to go. Now I'm going to go to menu, and then everything's going to come out of my hub here. Well, most things anyway. So hub, and then I'm going to go send set. So option one. Now I'm going to scroll down to color. So it is American color without the U. Okay, now we're working on a, a three color system. Okay, so I'm going to type in here um, 250 um, space down the bottom here, zero, space, zero. So you'll be able to see what that actually does here. Okay, so we have to save it first, so I'm going to go control B. Make sure that it says that it's stored successfully. And then I'm going to run it. So I'm going to go control R to run and push enter. And let's go over here. There we go. Red, green, blue, off. So that is lighting up your innovator hub. All right. So here we are going to do a little bit on the temperature sensor. Yeah. Um, so I've just got plugged in the side here, but this is my little temperature probe. Here, temperature sensor, NTC. Okay, I'm going to put it into input one. Plug that in there. Um, your innovator hub goes in as we did for the color. So A goes into the calculator, B goes into the hub, into the data port. Okay, all right, so I'll just keep that out of the way for the moment. So I'm going to go option one, option nine, program editor number one, <clears throat> and let's just call this temp. Okay, I should, I do. Okay, so first thing we have to do is say that we've connected the probe here. So I'm going to go menu. I'm going to go option eight hub, and then we have, see how we have connect, output, connect, oh, input, so option nine. And it's a temperature probe, so it's option four. Okay. Okay, so temperature, um, I've just got one temperature probe there, so I wanna input this into one. So one temperature probe, and then I'm going to go back to menu, go to hub, and I'm going to go to option three, which is settings, and then two. 
So I want my temperature, one, two, and I need to tell it which port. So I'm gonna go to uh, menu again, um, option eight. And you can see down here, if I scroll down, you can see there's an A there, ports. Okay, and we're in one, so option four. Okay. Um, now, that should be okay. I'm going to go enter. Now I'm going to hold this probe, just get a little bit of heat um, into it, and I'm going to go control R for run. There we go. So you can see it's reading my temperature 20 times over. Okay, done. Okay, thank you, Carly. Um, I also thought, so you see there you've got the explanation of both an actuator and a sensor. Um, something tricky that we can also do is you can actually use the input from the sensor, in this case, the temperature sensor that Carly demonstrated. You could use that in your code to inform what happens with the actuator. Now Carly also showed you on the RGB uh, diode in that order, red, green, blue. See the set color here, um, 0 to 50, 0. So th when this part runs, this is going to switch on green. So what I've done in, in my code here is this is using TI Basic, as you can see. I've connected the temperature input to input number one and reading from it. I'm calling that a variable T, and if it's less than 20, it's going to display on that onboard um, um, RGB, it'll display um, green. And if it's between 20 and 30 degrees, it'll display blue. And if it's higher than 30 degrees, well, then our red light will come on. So those sorts of things can be handy. And it, so we had there an example of an onboard actuator. Now, meanwhile, Sanjeev has a, a video for us, very interesting one, using a plug-in actuator. Uh, in fact, a, a water pump. Now, I'll try my share again from here. So what I'm holding in my hand is a water pump. Now, this water pump needs external power. So I've connected it to four cells of 1.5 volts, which is six volts altogether. And here is the communication link between the pump and this is connected to the innovator hub. It goes to the out port uh, of the innovator hub. What I'm holding now is an ultrasonic ranger and it's going to detect the water depth as the water level drops, it's going to detect the depth. And finally, this is the temperature and humidity sensor called the DHT sensor. It's going to record both the temperature and humidity. Now the uh, two sensors, that is the temperature and humidity sensor and the ranger are actually going in the inputs. So I've connected them to N1 and N2. And then the pump is connected to the 3.3 volts outlet uh, of the innovator hub. So those are the connections. Now I've just got water over here and I've made it blue so you can actually see the water moving. I've submerged the pump in the water. What I'll do now is to run the script and to run the script, I have to do control R. And when I run the script, you will see water from the first container now getting pumped into the second container. Now, uh, the conditions I supplied in the while loop will uh, always be met in this case. So uh, to exit the loop, I actually have to click the escape key. And I actually did put a script or a code for me to exit or break the loop. I'm just going to show that once I've uh, finished that. So here I've exited the script. Now I'll show you the actual code for that. So now, as you can see, I've got that while get key escape and underneath that I've got the other while loop with the condition. Now the script that I ran, 
the temperature was always greater than 15 and the humidity was always less than 85 so i had to escape the script and now you can see right at the bottom i've got the break script over there when i click the escape key so in view of this it is always advisable to add the while get key escape you know, as part of the loop if you want to prematurely exit the loop so i'm going to show you the actual code now the entire code so the first thing i've done is i've added the hub then the next thing is i've added the system uh, module because that's where i'm getting the get key escape so uh, the, to the second input i've added the temperature and humidity sensor and i've added the pump to the analog out out one that's 3.3 .3 volts so i'm saving the temperature or uh, i've stored it as temp and that's the measurement and the same thing for humidity and I've got a sleep over there for two seconds because I want the temperature to be actually picked up. Otherwise, the default temperature is negative 273 Kelvin. Now, the loop is running as long as the temperature is greater than or equal to 15 and the humidity is less than or equal to 85. And I've set the pump speed at 15. Now, the pump speed can be set from 0 to 255. So I've at the moment got it set at 50. So uh, you could vary the speed anything uh, between uh, 0 and 255 and you can actually give uh, you know various conditions which I'll show you in the next script. So now if I go further down I've got over here that print the temperature and print the humidity during each of the loops and I've put a sleep command of uh, 2 seconds. And then of course there's the break for the while get key escape so that really is the quote and right at the bottom i've set set the speed of the pump to zero and then also i can say set the pump to off okay um so peter and sanjeev um comment on that before i play the next one uh, so uh, you would have noticed i've got the print uh, temperature and uh, print humidity uh uh, line over there now that's something that's not necessary it's really for the user because when we are running uh -huh. scripts like this we don't really want to know what the temperature is because the if condition that uh, you will see in the next code will automatically end the loop if it needs to end if one of the conditions is not met so you can actually shorten the code by removing certain lines so some of the lines were not necessary but i included them you know for people who haven't done coding in python before just to understand how it all works Great idea. Yes, so they can see what's going on. So here's the other clip. Before I run the code, I'm going to explain the code. So I've got the TI hub module right at the top, and then I've got the TI system import, and that is for the while get escape key if I want to exit the loop. Now I've connected the temperature and humidity sensor to port 2, N2, and then Ranger is connected to port 1 and I'm using the ranger to detect the depth of the water and finally I've connected the pump to out 2 of uh, that's analog out and at each stage I'll be recording the temperature as temp and humidity as hum so I'm storing those as uh, constants there so the first thing is I've got the escape uh, loop and within that loop I have put the other conditional loop with a while loop now this loop, as long as this condition is met that the temperature is greater than or equal to 15 and the humidity is less than or equal to 85, this will run. But I have actually put some more conditions in there. So uh, now you can see, I'm saying if the temperature is greater than 15 and the humidity is less than 85, set the pump speed at 50. And of course, I'm wanting to print the temperature and humidity and the range at each stage. Then if else, if my temperature is greater than 20 and the humidity is less than 85, increase the pump speed to 100. And finally, I've said if the temperature is greater than 25 and humidity is less than 85, set the pump speed to 200. And lastly, I've just added another condition. I'm saying the moment the temperature exceeds 35 or the humidity exceeds 35, set the pump speed to zero. That means it will stop stop pumping the water. Now it's not exiting the loop yet. It will just stop pumping the water because I've set the speed to zero. But if you want, you can also add the 
pump off and the brake loop which I have done over there now but that's not necessary and of course the last else that you see is for the escape key that I sent so that will break the loop now this is going to print the temperature and it's going to print the humidity and also the range so now when I run the script you will see uh, three columns uh, are being printed so the first would be the temperature then the humidity and the range and the range should actually increase that means the depth of water is increasing so let's go and run the script now now i'm running the script control r and you can see water flowing in from container one into container two and you can see the temperature and the humidity changing and actually in the third column i forgot to place the ranger on top of container one and that's why the depth is showing constant as 1.3 however if i place the ranger on top of the blue container the depth would have continuously changed but you can see the temperature and the humidity changing now you can notice that the script has stopped and the temperature is not changing anymore and the water is not flowing anymore thanks sanjeev um really really great idea there um it's i, I like the idea of the ranger uh, to show the water depth because that's going to give us a continuous reading whereas uh, a lot of such systems are set up as just quite simply a, a, a binary choice, where if the water, for example, a, a ball cock, if the water goes below a particular level, it, it uh, flicks a switch, a bit like a, how a thermostat would work. Um, yeah, so, so uh, just, it's, uh, but you forgot to <laughs> you forgot to put it on on for your video, but uh, yeah. yeah, well, I think we, I think we can all see how how the idea works. Yeah, uh, so I'll just add a couple of comments to that one. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, uh, when I ex uh, set the pump uh, speed to zero and I hadn't, you know, put the brake loop, what that would mean, the script has paused temporarily and the moment the temperature drops to below 35, the script would redu uh, resume again and the pump would start uh, pumping the water again. So that's the uh, idea of setting the speed to uh, zero when, you know, the condition was not being met. So instead of breaking the loop, that's what we could do. And if I have to break the loop, of course, then I have to click the escape key. That was uh, one comment I wanted to make. And talking of the range of what I had done with my students in the class was, it was a rectangular container. So we measured the width and the, the height. Uh, sorry, uh, the height was oh, being wow. protected by the yep. ranger and we actually measured yep. the amount of volume of water that had actually been pumped out. So that was another task that we did. Yeah. So we, oh, you can that. include yeah. that as a calculation yeah. you know, by using the evaluate command. So it does uh, do a calculation. Yes. And, and again, you, you're saying that you wrote that into the code. Yeah. So given the particular. Yeah. Yeah. That, I like yes. that. Yeah. So, so uh, it can be. Just in uh, in initial before we start, we just put whatever the width for the container and the length is, and the height is determined by the ranger, and then we put the formula evaluate yep. within the uh, script, and it does. And you can do it at each stage, how much volume has been uh, pumped at each stage, rather than at the end as well. Great, yeah, I really yeah. like that. And and of course, you'd have to have some sort of subtraction there because the uh, the ranger had you had it set up, it's going to yeah, show so the, the original volume. Yeah. 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 Have, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great stuff. Um, thank you. Clever ideas. And and I'm, I'm again, I'm looking forward to, as I am one of the judges for this competition, I'm, I'm looking forward to see, uh, once again, some of the, uh, the creative ideas that people come up with uh, for their models. Now, the other main type of actuator, you've seen an example now of the onboard actuator, the uh, tricolour diode that's built into the Innovator Hub. And then a plug-in one, Sanjeev showing us the water pump. And of course, the idea of that uh, program not being broken could be that it's just set up permanently. It can just simply be an irrigation system and it's just switched on uh, and the pump is not necessarily running until it needs to be as per water levels and uh, humidity levels. Now, the other big thing, and this really takes it to sky is the limit, at the end of the Innovator Hub is a little uh, option for plugging in an external breadboard. If you looked at uh, your reference guide for the competition, uh, this is page five in the support document reference guide, and it uh, talks about the uh, breadboard contents 
and what you get if the an extension pack you do not have to use this by the way but uh, if you're interested this is the sort of stuff that comes in the breadboard extension pack now we've got uh, foxy to tell us about this so uh, peter i will transfer across to you thank you brian that is looking good this is what i was talking about at the end of the innovator hub the that's pins. it yep so what we've got here it, it's a very rough model that i've set up for people today but it's to give you an idea that we're not necessarily tied specifically to the sorts of actuators such as the servo the onboard speaker the rgb diode sitting on top of innovator or the water pump now with those in mind though the water pump and the servo people that have used those will have realized that you do need a separate power supply so with the ti innovator hub or any controller board like this sort of thing they generally only output a very small current so we still need to know a little bit about things like ohm's law and what sort of current we can put through these things innovator hub does have some onboard protection so if you try and run too much current through it it will actually stall and turn itself off to save itself. But a bit like Hal, the, the computer from 2001 Space Odyssey, it's not completely foolproof. You can destroy it if you try and run too much current. So I'm going to demonstrate how we can use the breadboard to power objects other than the standard actuators and using an external power source and an integrated circuit. So let's get started. We'll start with a breadboard. That's the one that comes with the breadboard pack, obviously. And I'm going to use what's called a L293D. This one's a Texas Instruments chip, of course. They come in various forms. Um, the little shapes on the top are important for locating which pins are which, and you generally need some sort of a pin map. But this one is a fairly simple circuit. If if any um, former physics or uh, physics teachers perhaps thinking about things like relays, think of it like a relay, the way we can switch stuff on and off. So you get the pin output that aligns to the integrated circuit. So you can now see why it's important to orientate the IC according to the pin map. So you can see it's got this little curved semicircular bit taken out of the top, and that's what the pin map looks like. So we put that onto the breadboard and it sits nicely in those little pin holes. You don't have to manipulate its little feet. They just push straight in. Just be wary you don't bend any, of course, otherwise it won't work. Um, and if you're wondering how expensive these things are, that one will probably set you back about $1.90, depending on where you get it from. So no big deal if you damage one of those because it's, you know, you won't even get half a cup of coffee for that. <laughs> Now, I've got a separate power supply that I've added, and I'm just putting that onto what we call the supply rail of the breadboard. You could put it directly to the IC, because what we're looking at is supplying the power to these external devices that we're going to run, or in this case, um, some motors. So we've got the power source coming in there, and then we wire it up to where it says here, pin eight on this integrated circuit. So that says up to 12 volts. So that means you could power something up to, you know, something that's going to require 12 volts. It hasn't mentioned current. You need to look at the specifications. But a small DC motor um, that you'd use in a hobby kit is not going to use up too much current for one of these things. The other thing you should be aware of, of course, is that if you're using things like DC motors, they have what's called overrun. So when you stop supplying power to them, they can continue rotating. And the reverse is true. If you supply electricity, you get the motor to run. If the motor's spinning and you don't supply electricity, it's actually generating electricity. It's what we call back EMF. So in other words, it's now trying to push electricity back through the circuit. And this particular chip is fairly robust and will block that. It has some diodes in there to block what we call back EMF. So that's it. That's all we need to power up this IC so it can supply power to something else. But we do need to connect some innovator power as well. So let's have a look where that comes from. I'm going to set it up to pin one and uh, on the breadboard from the TI Innovator Hub. And that goes into, as you can see there, pin number 16. 
and a ground. I've chosen ground 13. You could have chosen 12 or 4 or 5. It doesn't really matter. Um, so that supplies the logic power, if you like. So what's the difference? Well, the 5 volts that I'm getting from this battery pack or up to 12 volts that I'm getting for the battery pack, that's to supply the external circuit. But the power that I'm getting from the innovator hub is to actually power the logic inside this microprocessor chip that I've put on the breadboard. So if I had a 12 volt battery connected to this IC, I can't use that to power the IC because 12 volts is too much. Remember, it's basically like steering the 12 volts through to those other pins, the output pins. Um, the input pins are all logic controls, as you'll see in a moment. So that's my 3.3 volts to power the logic of this integrated circuit. Next, we want to wire up a battery, a motor rather. So here I'm lining up breadboard output number two, and that's coming down to pin two on my integrated circuit, where it says input one. So a three and a half volts is all this uh, chip requires to say on or off. So what I'm going to do, and you'll see the program in a moment, is literally just put a digital out on. So a digital output from breadboard, breadboard port number two, and I will set that to on. And then that little integrated circuit says, oh, I've received a on signal at input one, therefore output one will now go high. In other words, switch on. But it won't switch on the three and a half or four volts from the innovator hub it'll actually switch on up to 12 volts being supplied by this external battery. That's what it's designed to do. So a very small voltage, very small current coming out of innovator goes into input one and tells this circuit, okay, let the 12 volts or whatever power I supplied flow through to output one. It seems like a long way around, but now I can control four motors. You can see I've got four inputs and four outputs. So I can control four motors from this one little integrated circuit. Now, normally we can only one run a single servo motor from an innovator hub. This is allowing me to run up to four motors. So being a bit of a Lego enthusiast, I connected mine up to a little Lego motor. So now that's simply attach output one to the input of my Lego motor, and I need an earth, a ground if you like. Now, the ground I've picked up is from the breadboard because that breadboard ground is also attached to the chip. So it's one continual flow. All of those points, we covered that in that one of our earlier sessions, all of those points up there where it says negative or ground, they're all attached to each other. So any time you connect a pin in there, it automatically connects to any other pin in there. So that's our ground for the motor. You always need the two wires. So now our motor's ready to go. All I need to do is set up a program. So let's see what the program looks like. I've called my program uh, L293 DNE after the chip that it's controlling in this case. So we send connect digital out one to breadboard one. Remember, that's the power being sent to the integrated chip to supply the logic power. That's why I set up logic power to the IC, the integrated circuit. The next step is to actually switch that power on. I know it seems weird, but remember any other external things that we connect to Innovator Hub, the first thing you're gonna do is tell it where you've plugged it in, i.e. breadboard one, and give it a label. And this digital out is telling innovator, all I want is an off on signal. I'm not doing analog, I'm not controlling a specific amount of voltage, just full blast, which is about three and a half volts or four volts. So then this second command says, switch that power on. So now my integrated circuit is ready to use. The battery that I've connected is always live. I'm not controlling the battery per se, the integrated circuit is controlling that. So that's where this second command 
um, or rather breadboard two command comes up and that says, I'm going to run another digital output. I'll call that one number two and I'll connect it to breadboard two. So the last step is to, well, second last step technically, is to actually switch it on. That means the motor will actually come on because I've said logic out, switch that on. Pin number two is controlling the integrated circuit. And that will, the integrated circuit now kicks in and says, oh, I've received an input that is high or on or five volts or three and a half volts, somewhere in that ballpark. So it then allows the power from the battery to flow through to the motor. And then of course I switch it off. So a couple of things in there that we need to make sure that we know about these sorts of electronics. So now, Brian, here comes me trying to share a video. Let's see if I can share a webcam. All right, here's a funny little contraption that I've built. Lots of gears and cogs and stuff going everywhere, right? There's the actual little integrated circuit sitting on the board. Yep. And there's our little innovator hub. You can see all I'm doing, this one's actually got two external motors. So you'll see the one on the left, which is a green wire, that's supplying the logic power to the IC. And those other two wires you can see, um, they're supplying the control for the two motors on this peculiar contraption that I've built over here. And there's the little battery sitting there. So it's supplying the power to that little Lego motor and then another one stuck in over there. So if all things are working, they're working prior to the session. <laughs> so let's, let's see, I'll run it and let's see if we can get something to happen. Oh yes. Oh, one of the little bar arms has come off. There we go. And there we draw. Very good. TI meets Lego. Fantastic. Well, that's going to chug along for a little while. I should have put a little <laughs> option to break out of there. The lighting's not great to see the actual. You can see it can get a bit better. Yep. There we go. Yeah. It's a bit noisy, right? Drawing we need some color. Yeah. Quite the gears. Maybe I need to put something else on those Lego motors. Um, but you can see oh, the that... startings of a spirograph, and that's yes. just literally controlling. And and I could, if I wanted to, control the amount of power heading off to each one, um, and therefore slow them down. Instead, I just decided to control it using some gears because the Lego gears are easy to control. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what that program looks like. So it's not big. You can say it just said wait 40. So it's yep. exactly the same as what I had up on the screen before with the addition of digital out three to breadboard three. And then I've put a little text display to say that motor one is on and motor two is on just so I know that if something's not working, I can actually I, I know that the logic or the actual program has said get it going. So if there's a wire loose or something not working um, in the background, which you wouldn't have seen, thank goodness, is a little multimeter, which I also use to check to make sure I'm getting the right voltages to the places where I sent them. Um, so that's how all of that stuff works. It's, um, I think, fairly straightforward. And I think it's a great opportunity for kids to actually play around with an integrated circuit, you get some that are really robust, and a lot of them are nowadays, um, that you can just run little motors without any extra resistors, diodes, or anything like that because of the way those ICs are set up. Yeah, great stuff. And look, once again, I'm thinking, Peter, we've got some uh, some pretty powerful uh, ideas here. Um, can I, I'll just, just reiterate that... Um, you don't have to use all this stuff. What we're doing is we're just showing what can be available. So, um, uh, yep. Yeah, so, so it's it's just tasting ideas in this um, in this series.
Now, there is one other thing that we haven't talked about at all, but I quite like it, uh, and that is the TI Innovator Rover. Now, uh, uh, once again, you use it. Um, it it's, I think it's a great bit of kit because it's easy, it's very easy to program and it's a lot of it is all set up for you. I've, I've uh, in recent years, talked about this and done activities at, uh, at various conferences. Uh, one thing I did was getting two ro rover robot cars and crashing them together. Um, but this is what it looks like. If you want to, if you think you might use that in your project, then uh, take a look on the uh, website for activities and support ideas for that. Of course, it links beautifully through to all of the STEM. And it has onboard sensors and onboard actuators. Uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, actuators that I've got up here, you know, connecting RV, and I can set the RV colour. It, it has a, a tricolour LED as well, just like the one that, that um, Carly showed you. So I can switch on the, the red, uh, but not the green, but to switch on the blue, I think I get a lovely magenta colour there for five seconds, and then it switches off. Also underneath it, it actually has a, uh, a full colour sensor. This is pretty cool. So I'm reading colour input, and depending what the colour is, it's assigned a particular number. So, for example, you could say if it reads red, it will, it will return a value. This get C, this C value will be number one. And then you can say, what do I want it to do in response to that? Do I want it to turn left, turn right? Uh, do I want it to, while it's reading red, to keep um, turning towards it? You can actually set it up to follow a set path or move away. Now, probably our, our expert trainer in this area is Jody, um, and Jody has set Jody uh, Crothers from West Australia. He has set up some uh, little videos just to show us some really simple stuff here. As I said, this is a this is a favourite of mine to use. Is the Rover, um, and you can see Jody's website there. I would recommend if you um, if actually I'm going to. To just share from my computer straight out i think if, if you um yeah if you want to know more about rover go to jody's w website here or, or youtube channel now this is one of the little videos he sent for us just simply switching on a motor just like what peter did there's some very simple commands to set this up so that's just one wheel turning you can set the motors to go in different directions uh, and if you oppose the motors, like for example, if the left wheel moves one way and the right wheel moves the other, then you can make the make the rover turn. There's both forward, both back, one each way, one each way. It's as simple as that. Uh, so the other one I mentioned was that um, RGB diode. I will quickly show you that one. Uh, so this is the Rover LED, and you can see the different colours responding to different levels in the program. And there we have it. So that's us uh, about on time here. Um, Thank you to everyone who has contributed, well, not just today, today's been a big session, but not just today, but all the way through our um, uh, Codes Club program. In particular, of course, for today, we had Peter and Sanjeev with contributions from Carly and Jody. If you want to see more and stay connected about with the contest, we have the TI newsletter, uh, a copy of which actually sent out today. And of course, look at us on our socials. That's our final session for the TI Codes Club for, for the moment. We hope that uh, you've learnt some things along the journey, and we also hope that you may be inspired to enter the competition. We're looking for, remember, just stage one. You're not actually building anything. It's just your proposal. Uh, and that is due this Friday. 
So thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Peter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. And of course, and of course, thank you to all of our participants. A reminder, if you want to watch all of this again, go to our webpage for the recording or for the uh, YouTube to our YouTube channel, Texas Instruments Australia. Farewell to all.